We're going to mention a few others, but we're going to mostly be talking about antisocial. So what is a personality disorder? Well, it's an enduring pattern <coughs> of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture. Enough for one minute. It's pervasive and it's also inflexible. People with personality disorders tend to not be as flexible as people without personality disorders. Also, they tend to have their onset in, in adolescence or early adulthood. And it tends to be stable over time. It's personality, so you, you, you expect to have stability with the person's personality. Obviously, a personality disorder or any kind of mental health disorder, uh, it leads to distress or impairment. Right, you have if it's dysfunctional, there has to be something, some kind of a problem that follows, right? It can't be all good. So that's all from the DSM five. <clears throat> now also personality disorders, they tend to manifest themselves in two or more of the following ways. How people think, they think differently than the people who don't have personality disorder. And also, their affective regulation is different than people who don't have that, too. But then also, interpersonally, they tend to be different. They're all differences. And then finally, impulse control. People with, uh, certainly with antisocial personality disorder, tend to be more impulsive. Okay? So that's one of the things that you'll see as well. So another aspect of it is you can differentiate from the traits by the functional impairment of the subjective distress of the individual. <clears throat> Sometimes you can identify a person's personality disorder with only one interview. Has anybody ever done that? <laughs> yeah, right. Probably not when you first started, but these are pervasive, right? And so once you've had some clinical experience, sometimes it doesn't take all that long, does it? If it's um, a more severe example of personality disorder or any other disorder for that matter. A patient may not experience distress, because this may not be a problem for them. They're okay, they're good. What's your problem? So some of the guys I worked with in prison, being a penitentiary for decades, what's the problem? What's the problem? I'm good, I'm okay. Not too many of us want to live that way. They seem to do it, keep going. So in that way, I guess, in that way you can say they're functional. I use that word very loosely. Also, you gotta rule out medical causes and other medical uh, disorders, other mental disorders, rather. And also, if you're not sure if the individual meets all the criteria, the disorder, you can always put down antisocial traits in, in, in the same box, so to speak, so that we can be talking kind of in the same ballpark, but maybe not, they don't meet the full diagnosis. Now, antisocial and narcissistic personality disorder are more often diagnosed in men. Histrionic and Dependent and borderline personalities are more often diagnosed in women. Now, sometimes people kind of overlook and forget that these diagnoses can be diagnosed in either gender. So you can't forget that. Because I've interacted with 
folks of both genders or other genders who have different uh, personality disorders. So they can be against what the classical presentation would be. Now, some of these specific aspects of a pervasive pattern, pervasive pattern of disregard for the violation of the rights of others. Probably not a big surprise, right? Because the people who just don't put it uh, in the way. Uh, put an emphasis on other people's rights. It's all about their rights. And in order to meet the criteria, we have to add uh, three or more of the following. <clears throat> it says up here, failure to conform to social norms with respect to all the behaviors. As indicated by repeatedly performing Acts that are beyond score of press. Deceitfulness, as indicated by repeated lying and use of aliases or common numbers for personal profit or pleasure. And then impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. So those are some of the things that we're looking for. Irritability and aggressiveness is indicated by repeated physical flights and assaults. <clears throat> Reckless disregard for safety of self or others. Consistent irresponsibility is indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior or harm financial obligations. Lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent to or rationalizing, having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from other people. <laughs> What's that sound? Is there a bit of a din? <coughs> Is it okay? Or not? Some of the other parts of this personality disorder, they tend to be preoccupied with manipulated, being manipulated, going to manipulate others. They don't want to be had. They don't want to be beaten. And I'll have to admit, having done what I did all those years, I didn't want to be beaten either. I don't mean physically beaten, although I didn't want to be beaten up. Um, but I didn't want to be had by these people. Your lifetime on people. I, I want to have my own story, so to speak. So that's a pretty common thing in the individuals. Sometimes when you work with these folks a lot, hey, you kind of kind of a game to play. You don't want to be beaten either. How many of folks in here have worked in law enforcement? How about those folks in the well, detective system, legal system, uh, legal system, maybe not this one, law enforcement. So, preoccupation, manipulating or being manipulated, central affect, being enraged or enmity. The belief about the self that I can make anything. It's a top block of nuts. You work for this place. I think I'm probably saying that for other than I think they're kind of untouchable. I don't get caught. Beliefs about other people, everyone is selfish. For a person who intends to be selfish, they tend to believe everyone else is like them and they're selfish. They believe that everyone's manipulative. <laughs> Dishonorable. <clears throat> Primary 
psychological defense is reaching for omnipotence. Um, so a total control. That's what they really want to control. They have that they've got it. In their mind. That's all they need. Control. They're very focused on being in control. Not being run over, not being had, not being done wrong. Now, the antisocial personality and disorder person believes that prison is the final injustice in a long string of injustices in their life. Man, I will never keep them down for decades. And this is just the last straw. In the past, laws, rules, and rights meant little to these folks. In prison, they can become finally realistic about their rights. You guys have noticed that, right? Because people in prison have rights, right? And you can have what we call a jailhouse lawyer who becomes uh, not criminal, but they become, that's what they do, that's how they do their time. And they just they have to take legal work. Do it for other inmates or whatever. And for themselves. And they're always looking for an angle, a way to beat the system. And uh, they're very, very concerned about their rights or the rights of their clients. Despite being in prison, the antisocial personality disorder individual. Expects to do as he pleases and for the prison to accommodate him. How do you think that works? Anybody ever work in prison? How's that going to work? Not too well. Sometimes, you know, for the worst of time, periods of time, but overall, overall not too well. <clears throat> These folks convey a powerful presence. They understand what motivates, uh, has to do with what makes him or her feel powerful, look powerful. They want to look and feel powerful and very important. They want to be part of the world and look at them. Very important. To look and feel powerful. You can educate the individual regarding the errors in thinking, you know, as a psychologist or a counselor, as part of the treatment. You can predict destructive consequences for itself and others if they continue along that way. Disruptive behavior it gives people a lot of trouble in prison. One of the drivers of disruptive behavior, uh, often, become, often because the individual feels disrespected or is told no by others. So being told no, that means folks with antisocial personality disorder typically don't like to be told no. I see that with uh, teenagers when I work with them. They may not have the control disorder, but they have certain traits, kind of the budding, onset of that. Not going to into a whole lot of trouble. But no. Right? So you want people to be able to hear no. That's normal. Being told no. They used to tell inmates to find us on the bottom of the building. No. That don't mean all the time, but sometimes. Suicidal, and uh, in the end, many times it's because 
there is extreme unrest right now, and it really means that if they're wrong means in doing it, they will either flirt around with the idea of killing themselves, hurting themselves, or at some, some points actually make attempts to do so. It's without any Typically, understanding how their uh, all of the things tend to be about power. As a sad man, we get all the pain. We don't have so much that we're supposed to live. That's the whole life, at least for now. And so it's really important. We're, we're stuck there for years, maybe even decades. Now, they can be reasoned with, which is a good thing. Now, they operate from an egocentric perspective, right? Everything revolves around, revolves around itself. That's typical, just like a child or a young person. Egocentric. And altruism is not something that motivates these people. Actually, you're weak if you're all through this. That's the way that you can be attached, you can be manipulated, you can be used, period. But that's a weakness to them. Any questions or comments on that? Yes? Didn't the, or is there still an age criteria that they have to fall into to get that age? Yeah, we're looking at, um, typically we're looking at around age 15 when we start to see these characteristics begin to crystallize. So you can still get a diagnosis out of being an adult, right? You can still diagnose someone with that sort of personality disorder. If they're over, what was it, over the age of 22 or something like that? Well, I tend to not diagnose that disorder until I get somebody who's more like 18 years old, because, you know, I feel like kids or young folks, they still have the opportunity to maybe pull it out of the dial, you know, and uh, see, I mean, certainly I've worked with a lot of kids who are in their teenage years, and they certainly seem like they have the diagnosis, but I tend to want to, Wait a little bit longer, talk about traits, things of that nature, because it's pretty damning you know, for a child to be given a label like that. So, in terms from your experience dealing with the antisocial personality disorder in a person with, say, schizophrenia, would you say the best, uh, I guess, approach, negotiating approach with them might be? setting up the bargain? I mean, what would you say was the number one tool that got them from A to B in negotiating compliance? Yeah. Well, certainly we do a lot of things negotiating. Um, yes, it ended up being a lot of, um, well, they just started demanding this up here. We kind of have to work them down. I think we used to uh, do a lot of hostage negotiation training and stuff, at workshops around the country, um, and then with some individuals in our institutions. Um, these would be people who were big along the moon, you know, to get to get to get some of that to the point. And it was pretty amazing how they could. Eventually, they could kind of read the writing on the wall and realize, I'm not getting that. And they were able to switch to be more reasonable, more realistic, and settle for less. So there's a lot of negotiation. And other times, it could be somebody who uh, ends up being uh, locked up. Um, you put somebody who is a 
been badly in a prison. Uh, it's known on an inmate as a whole. We don't want to call it it's just a more secure place, but it's what inmates are called. So you'll um, you'll see folks who will uh, end up thinking that they made this game up to try to get something out of the sack. And they thought they really had something coming, and they realized they had nothing coming because they want to uh, And so then they will begin to realize because the world is over. And they can kind of see that coming. Uh, I ain't got nothing coming. And then they realize that it's not more. It's just not good for them. Um, so it just kind of depends on who you're dealing with. That. Is this what they do? Is this how they do their time? And when I see them, they're all the time. It's one after another. And then what I want to do is that periodically something bad happens and they end up in death and they end up something's come up. They feel like they're all the time. They want to do something. They want to make something happen. So, yeah, a lot of it is. Them trying to negotiate, trying to maybe scare that. It doesn't happen very often. Even get new staff to scare these into the season staff that comes to scare them up when an inmate does and says they do whatever. But they may have this feeling that, oh my gosh, I really got them now. Yes, sir. In the previous life, <clears throat> as an intermittent strategy, the first thing on the list was to become powerful or something like that. You said that be powerful. I don't know. Let's see if I can find that. Okay. You say a powerful presence. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. this would be. This would be an inmate or a, an individual with this disorder wanting to, wanting to convey a powerful presence. Oh. You're not suggesting that we present a powerful presence to them? We want to present a presence that somebody who's got their act together, but we don't want to be in competition of who's the toughest. Okay, I can agree. I can agree. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be. We would, we would want to convey a competent presence. The inmate would most likely want to convey a more powerful presence. More like integrity. Yeah, we don't want to get into a power struggle with somebody who is super important to them to be most powerful, toughest, whatever. We just need to sidestep that. Let them think they're whatever. Yeah, we want to, we want to avoid kind of the We've had to do that before. We've kind of had to shut down the game, the whole game, on it, and um, really run the risk of somebody being maybe, uh, maybe somebody being so upset, maybe they feel humiliated, something like that. Certain antisocial types may feel like they do some pretty significant bad stuff. We want to try to avoid kind of pushing them in that direction. This word lucid, learning disabled, uh, slow learner. Um, and there is some research to back this up. But the folks who have antisocial personality and psychopathic uh, disorder, these folks do tend to show different thinking patterns, different problem solving patterns, do tend to, to be slower to learn some of the likely outcomes of various methods of solving problems. If, if folks that don't have that disorder, they don't we don't see it in these people. So we do see some brain changes in their ability to learn from their experience. And then also behavior that has short-term positive consequences with long-term negative consequences. So that's 
that's something we see with antisocial behavior. So when I work with folks, I'm explaining that to them. Look, you can do your behavior, it does have some positives. There are positives to this. The problem is that positives tend to be short term and the long term tend to be negative. So again, I'm not going to say that their behavior doesn't pay off ever. Because it does at times. But in the long term, it's more likely to be negative. Now, they're capable of learning if the environment is consistent. Consistent. The problem is you get into some of these situations where the behavior in the environment is so dysfunctional that people are getting rewarded for the wrong things. And now they get really mixed up. So, wait a minute, does this work or not? But they get really confused. They're not. Uh, unintelligent. It's just in this area, they tend to have great difficulty piecing this out. And that's part of the therapy with these folks is helping them see that. And also, these folks tend to be highly concerned with their reputation. Definitely concerned about what people think about them on the board or uh, when they set up, sell out. And that is uh, to their detriment. I wish they didn't care so much. I really do. Make things a lot easier for them. They don't have to worry about what other people think. Um, so if you're going to be uh, working with these folks, your own reputation, my own reputation, my integrity is crucial. That is crucial. So I want to treat people the way I want to be treated. I want them all like me. I want to hold on to values that I want to see them adopt. Okay? Honesty. You know, just basic stuff like that. Sometimes they maybe hadn't really seen that before. Consistently. So I want to see what works like. I also want to be holding these folks accountable. I'll be straightforward. I want to show respect and don't be unprofessional. It might be tempting for some people in a professional environment to be unprofessional because maybe they think they can get away with it. It's not professional. Don't do that. Be professional. Don't be unprofessional. Plus, Prisons can be blown up. People can get hurt badly when people don't respect the prisoner. So understand that they are very accountable, <clears throat> some more than others. Don't interject yourself in the patient's power struggle. You're not a politician. You have an inmate wants to argue about all kinds of different things. You don't need to argue with the inmate, you're not a politician. Who cares? Sometimes people want to do it, they want to be right. Who cares? We get to go home with them. They're stuck in the cell. Who cares? You know, so part of it is just understanding that you're doing something totally different than you are. And that's having some sympathy, some empathy. I talk about really feeling sorry for inmates. I never did feel sorry for inmates. I just mean that understanding they're in a difficult situation. They put themselves in it in prison, but they are in a difficult situation. And just to acknowledge that. Okay. Antisocial people who we'll talk about hybrid personality disorder. Something you may have never heard of in school. Not every person with a personality disorder is just one guy. You can have people with more than one guy. <clears throat> so, a lot of things you see in prison a lot is people who have antisocial and 
and narcissistic personality disorder traits. Okay? So you have these kind of people, which you will have them during children. Avoid making them defensive or feel belittled in a malignant hearing or want to control them. We want antisocial and borderline folks who are hybrid. We want to validate their emotional experience while not coming off as telling them what to do. It's kind of taking a little bit from each personality disorder and figure out how you need to play this. So be sensitive to both of the personality disorders. Unsolved peers a lot. Sometimes these people will not drive the train. Especially if they find it in Um, own your own style. Now, I've had some colorful people I work with in you know, New York City. And it was very difficult to get into the inner meetings and get into things. But I had to realize along the way that I'm not them, they're not me. I can't be them, I just have to be me. And over the years, I've found my own way. And then ended up being very comfortable with it. And able to teach a lot of younger people my way. Doesn't mean they have to do it my way, but it gives them something, right, for granted. And there's something you can change so you figure out what works best for you. Seek supervision. Now here's another one I'm going to do. Practice interventions out loud. See, I tended to drive home from the prison that I last worked at was about an hour. And in doing that, sometimes I would drive with a group of co-workers in the van and we would discuss this stuff. But then other times I might just drive alone. And uh, sometimes it's helpful to practice like an actor what you would say to an inmate in different situations. It makes you a much better intervention. Anybody ever do that? It's kind of just kind of roll your legs for yourself. Yeah, they do. You guys are smart. <laughs> That's what the cool kids do. Um, it works. It does it work because you, you've already practiced it out loud. You already know how it sounds. Sometimes you hear it and you think, oh, that doesn't sound good. Right. And other times you hear it and you think, oh, that's perfect. You come across sounding better, more realistic, more legit. And you actually find out how to perform for you. I also mentioned on here uh, read, read, read. There is a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, the DBT stuff is really good. That's not specifically for antisocial folks, but it can be really good stuff. And then I also put on here something from a Christian perspective. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Um, meaning, consider who you're working with. Sometimes these antisocial people that you're working with are not able to function in such a way that they can actually make use of what it is that you're training them and teaching them. It's not there yet. You may think, gosh, we didn't get it, but this must not work. No, it didn't work very well. It's just the individual that you were working with wasn't ready to hear that. Don't give up, don't give up. Maybe the next person will. Next third person will know. That may be the person. And then one last one. I got this one from somebody. The teacher appears when the student is ready. That's another good one. I think that is the saying in some way. I think that's how I talk to my client. I think. I know, I'm sorry. It wasn't supposed to be funny, but it sounded pretty funny. So I carry it around with the headaches. Yes. 
So over the course of time, when you've dealt with the antisocial personality disorder, I mean, obviously, they can go through a wide range of emotional gymnastics to alter the playing field. <coughs> Have you run into situations where these individuals then start to play on the Baker Act <coughs> process as a way of extracting themselves from the jail setting or possibly even the prison setting and asserting, you know, trying to assert the criteria housed in the Baker Act. And so, if so, how do you, how do you ferret out the malingering behavior from the actual, seriously, this person's at risk of suicide or this person's at risk of homicide? And how do you, how do you draw that distinction uh, just from your personal experience? Yeah, that's a good question. Let me just say, I work in uh, Texas, and we don't have a paper after. Some of them may have uh, come out here, we have some of them may have, but just in general, um, people who are attempting to feign mental illness or suicidal or some other thing under the mental health umbrella, I guess I know a whole lot. My career. I think anybody who works in correctional psychology does. You have to. Uh, kind of depends on uh, how much freedom you're given, on your uh, wardens and associate wardens, executive staff, how much confidence they have in you, uh, what kind of policies and procedures does your agency have? You know, are they good? Do you feel very comfortable with yourself? Neuro prisons just had a bad last night with this uh, sex offender guy uh, over the weekend type scene. That's us. So I'm happy about that. I haven't, because I've been retired and I'm not trying to live that life anymore, I haven't asked anybody on the inside to worry about it. You know, it's, sometimes when you first retire, you can't let go. You gotta find out all this stuff. I, I care about it. I don't care about what I'm supposed to do. It's not, you know, it has nothing to do with me anymore. Um, but um, I've done a lot of workshops here on dealing with suicidality and uh, risk assessment, intervention for folks who are suicidal, homicidal, people who. Uh, here to be suicidal, but they are. So we certainly have a whole lot of that in the Bureau of Prisons for a variety of reasons. Uh, and it is, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole toolbox full of tools to figure these, to be really good with these people. Because it's pretty dangerous if you don't know what you're doing in terms of having to deal with patients kill themselves. Part of my I was pretty used to it, so I had several years of it. That's what we did. But starting out, sometimes I would think, most people don't do this. And uh, you end up being pretty good at it if you do it long enough and you study it a lot. And uh, that's part of it, that's one of the competencies of correctional psychology. Being able to be aware of those situations. Okay, we are out of time. So.